Hey guys, welcome to the Dixie Cryptid Podcast. You can also find this podcast on the Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcast by doing a search for What If It's True? It'll pop up right at the top of the list. I've got one story in this video. I hope you enjoy it. It should have an impact on you. It should make you think and it should make you a little bit scared. I thought it was awesome. Well, let's jump into the story. All right, here we go. All right, here's an email from, uh, well, they don't really say whether to use their names or not, but I won't. I think they mentioned the names in the story, so you'll you'll probably get it. And if you hear some background noise, that's my air conditioner. It, it is 100 degrees here today, and I'm going to keep it running. Here's what these folks, uh, man, it's a husband and wife. They, they put together this story, and I thought it was great. Here's what they say. My wife and I are originally from Cincinnati. However, for the past 30 years, we've traveled all over North America with our camper and boat and enjoyed the beauty and the bounty of this beautiful continent. We always make it back to Cincinnati for the holidays with our children and grandchildren, but the rest of the year we spend on the road. In 1999, we were in a community in Alaska where we like to salmon fish and to hunt caribou. We always gave 99% of our catch along with two caribou that we took there once to the locals. The meat was more than we could eat and the indigenous people appreciated the extra food. It earned us some lifelong friendships. You couldn't imagine our joy when on this year one of the young tribe members offered to take us to one of his spots to fish, a place where few outsiders have ever been. It demonstrated his trust in us which was a great honor. The sight was nothing short of amazing. It was everything our young friend had promised, and the wide stream, nestled between two small mountains and surrounded by woods, was no deeper than our knees. The water was crystal clear with a sandy bottom, and it was teeming with salmon. Two other members of the tribe were there when we arrived. They recognized us and offered a friendly wave, Eight large bears were also enjoying the abundant salmon, but our friend told us not to panic. Don't bother them and they'll leave you alone, he said. He explained that they too were fishing for salmon, and chasing us off would require too much energy. And then he said, but if they grab one of our fish, just cut the line and start over, or they will go after our catch. Just let them have it. There's plenty more fish out there. We'd been fishing for two hours and everyone was catching enormous kings. The bears were having a good day as well. We were all having a great time when we heard a roar from across the creek. Two of the other fishermen left. They didn't even gather their catch. The bears all stopped fishing and ran into the woods away from the sound. Our guide said, we have to go now. I must have given him a defiant look because he added, we need to leave now and leave the catch. We sensed the urgency in his voice. and We knew there was danger present, so we followed him back to his truck. He didn't speak a word until we were back on the main road, and I noticed that he kept checking his rearview mirror. What's going on? I kept asking. Was it a bear? What made that noise? And why did the other bears run off? The suspense was killing me, but he would never answer. Finally, once we were on the main road, he said, Kushtaka. What in the world is Kushtaka? I asked. I could see that he was clearly upset to even speak of it. He paused for a minute and gathered his words before saying, You do not live in this land and you should not know all of its secrets. But Kushtaka is he who rules over all the land. He paused for a minute and then he continued. He lays claim to all and requires tributes from us to hunt and fish his land. That is why we left our catch. If we hadn't done that, it would have brought bad luck to our people, and we would have faced his anger. He refused to speak any more about it, and when he dropped us off at the small campground outside of town where we had made camp, he told us to be ready to go by 8 a.m. tomorrow, and then he left. 
We spent the night trying to envision exactly what Kashtaka was. Was it a bear or some sort of monster? Years later, we learned that Kushtaka is called the Otterman. At the time, we never would have come up with that in any way, shape, or form or fashion. Over the next four days, our guide took us to more commonly fished and therefore more crowded areas. He refused to take us back to his honey hole. But on the fifth day, we told him we were going to go out on our own. And we found our way back up to the secret spot where the bear had returned and were feasting on the fatty fish. There were no other fishermen around. Jesse and I concealed ourselves in the thick brush along the creek and waited as the bears walked within feet of us, not even giving us a second look. At 4 p.m., the roar bellowed again, sending the bears fleeing into the bush and leaving the stream for Kushtaka. Once the bears were gone and everything settled down, three enormous creatures, a huge male, a female with sagging breasts, and a younger male, walked into the creek and began to grab fish. They'd shove the belly of one fish into their mouths and eat the eggs with one hand while reaching down into the water to grab another fish with the other. Their mouths seemed to stretch from ear to ear. The bodies were completely covered in hair except for their faces and the palms of their hands, and their large black eyes were set further apart than a human's. Their noses gave the appearance of being smashed into their faces, and their foreheads sloped back to conical heads. We couldn't see their ears for all the hair. They stood in the middle of the creek, knees bent, and scooped up the salmon with large hands that were attached to arms that extended below their knees. Eventually, they squatted or sat down in the creek and used their arms to guide the fish into their laps. And after they took one large bite from the fish's bellies, they'd cast them aside and grab the next one. More fish bodies floated past us than we could count. The male stood nine feet tall, and it was at least five feet across. His hair was black. Gray was mixed in throughout his hair, but mostly concentrated on his chin and chest. The female was more of a reddish brown. She stood two feet shorter than the male, and the hair on her breast was much more sparse than on the rest of her body. She wasn't nearly as broad as the male. The juvenile was quite a bit smaller than either of the adults. He was the same size as our young Indian guide and covered in deep brown hair. They remained focused on the salmon for quite some time. They only stopped eating to defecate or urinate. Even then, they didn't get out of the water, which might be the reason their stool is never found. I brought my 35 millimeter camera, and I managed to snap off two whole 36 exposure rolls of film unnoticed. The rushing water masked the clicking sound of the camera's shutter. A storm was approaching, and when the wind kicked up, we retreated. We were unobserved. I couldn't wait to see how our pictures turned out. We drove straight to a little store to have them developed. And that is how it was before digital cameras, laptops, and the internet. Jesse and I had just spent two hours observing three animals that were thought to exist only in myth, or at best, rarely seen. Aside from the Patterson-Gimlin film, most evidence was footprints, but now we had solid proof that these animals exist and we could give them the protection they need. As we watched, we'd heard them vocalizing with each other. and It was a mix of clacking and popping sounds made by their lips and teeth combined with purring and cooing. They even had a language that sounded like Chinese or Japanese. Three days later, when we went to pick up our pictures, we were heartbroken when we were handed an empty envelope. We decided it didn't matter, though. We were already planning our next trip to the creek. We would get more pictures. Two elders were standing by our truck when we walked outside. They asked us to join them for a ride in their beat-up Suburban, 
and we excitedly jumped in to the back seat. When a ride was offered, it usually meant that they were going to show us something special. And in the past, they'd taken us to see several secret tribal areas, including burial grounds, totem poles, and some drawings on cliffs and rocks. That day, there wasn't much conversation on the trip other than a little small talk. We drove for half an hour along dirt trails and creek crossings until we arrived in an old log cabin that looked like it had been abandoned. The roof was peeled back, the windows were knocked out, the door was missing. A few outbuildings looked like they had been bulldozed over. It had been left to nature, and nature was greedily taking it back. We pulled up to the cabin, and the two elders got out and went to sit on a couple of big rocks. And they waited for us to approach them before the chief began to speak. We know of your curiosity and we worry about your lives as well as the lives of our people when you leave. Your photos were destroyed, but we cannot stop you from going back to take more. I want you to know everything that will occur if you do. This cabin belonged to a family from the lower states, he said, gesturing with his hand. They wanted to live off the grid, as they put it, to teach their children how to live off the land. They lived here for a couple of years, and they were well liked by our people. We shared many of our traditions with them to help make their lives easier. To continue the story was becoming difficult for the chief, and the other elder took over. The father had constructed a smokehouse for the salmon he had taken that year, and the bears tore it apart, stealing most of their catch. This led to concerns that there would not be enough food to get through the winter. They drove to town and bought several boxes of ammo for the father's hunting rifle. The next week he returned to town to buy more salt to cure the meat from a huge moose he had harvested. He told us then that he was afraid the bear would return. The old man lowered his head and thought for a moment before he continued. We listened to his story about his moose hunt and about all of his concerns, and we realized that this might be Kushtaka. We advised him to leave a quarter of the meat out further away from the house, but he said they had taken enough and he wasn't giving up any more. That night, he had strung cans with rocks in them to alert him of the meat thieves, and sure enough, that night, he heard something and ran out to chase it off or to shoot it. We know he hit something from the blood that trailed into the bush and the large footprints we found along the trail. By this time, the chief regained his composure and continued the story. We grew concerned a couple of days later when we did not see him or his family back in town. They never came back. Several of our tribe drove up there to find his cabin torn open like you see it now. All the other buildings had been beat down to the ground and there were Kushtaka footprints all over their home site. We found the father curled up right over there. He pointed to an old mountain hemlock tree. He was clinging to life, but twisted and beaten. His body was covered in blood, and his legs were broken, and we later learned that he'd suffered internal damage. We rushed him to town, where he was taken by helicopter to Anchorage for treatment. He kept muttering, they came, they came, and they took my wife and daughter. He never said anything else, just those same words over and over. State troopers came to investigate, and they questioned us. They asked us if he could have killed his family, and we didn't believe that he could have. The troopers concluded that it must have been a bear that did all that damage. And again, the chief stopped and shook his head, but we knew better. We are of the land and of the water, and we could see the tracks and the claw marks on the building. We followed the blood trail before the troopers destroyed the evidence, and we saw where the injured Kushtaka ran toward the river. We saw where it had fallen several times before it was picked up and carried by other Kushtaka. We did not venture further. We did not want to risk the consequences of trespassing on Kushtaka land. The chief's eyes filled with tears as he said, The wife was nowhere to be found, nor was the daughter. 
Our stories tell of many times when Kushtaka would come to our villages and take women and children. The chief told us that he had driven to the hospital to visit the man, and he found him curled up in his bed repeating, They came. Over the next five years, the chief made that same trip every year. And then some of his family from the lower 48 came and took the father home. The chief told us that he felt responsible for what happened because he knew that it was Kushtaka when the father first came to town for the ammo, but he didn't tell him about the beast, and he said he should have. Several hunters from our village came up missing that year, and half of our dogs disappeared, he said. They were dragged away in the middle of the night. Kushtaka came to take his revenge. And just like he took his revenge on the father for shooting one of his own, He let him live, but he broke his leg so he couldn't walk. He could only lie there and watch. After hearing this story, Jesse and I began to think about what would happen if we had taken those photos and then showed them to the wrong people. This peaceful slice of heaven would be overrun with people trying to kill or capture one, and the people who would pay dearly for it would be the local tribe. We decided to leave the Kushtaka be. We made a few more trips up there and tried to earn the tribe's trust again, but it was never the same. The community never showed the trust that they once had. They were always nice to us and respectful. They just didn't share stories or traditions with us ever again. We never returned to the guide's honey hole after that. We saw the guide a few times, but he always turned and walked the other way. He never spoke to us again. Jesse and I eventually decided never to return to the village. We'd lost the joy we once felt by being there, and it was a costly lesson in trust. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it, maybe you could hit the subscribe button plus the thumbs up. Maybe even leave a nice comment. I would love that. I would appreciate that. I'll be back soon with another podcast, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you. Thank you.